Hallelujah. Well, let's get back into the word. Father, we thank you for the word today. The entrance of your word will bring light and understanding. Lord, I ask that today somebody will be challenged. Somebody will be fruitful. Somebody today will have a new lease of life. Above all, Lord God, I ask that your name be glorified and the enemy be terrified. So that the name of the Lord Jesus be glorified and the enemy be terrified. Well, let's give the Lord a clap off. Now, when we're talking about fruitfulness, we've been, talking, we've been going on about fruitfulness for the past few weeks, and it's very important for us to understand that it's a way of glorifying God. I said last week, that one of the areas that we glorify God in John chapter 17, Jesus said, I have glorified the Lord and with the Lord that you have given me. How did he say that? He said in verse 4, he says, by accomplishing every work you have given unto me. Amen? Amen? And so when you fulfill what God has given you to do, you are glorifying God. From the very beginning, Jesus Christ, uh, God said, be fruitful and multiply. So if we're not fruitful, we are actually not fulfilling what God has called us to do. Amen? And so we're going to take this a step further, but before we uh, go any further, I, I want us to just re uh, recap the promises that God gave us for this year. This year is being the year of fruitfulness. I hope you understand that this, there's no gimmick when it comes to Jesus Christ, when it comes to the Lord. We're not here to play games. Quite frankly, I would rather do something else than be playing games. Amen? Fruitfulness is something that we need, that is something that glorifies God. And if we're not being fruitful, I think it's important that we begin to look at the principles, amen, that will make us fruitful. And uh, But before we do that, we look at this thing, the Lord spoke to our spirit, and this year is a year of fruitfulness, amen. And one of the scriptures that he gave us was in Exodus chapter 9, verse 4, he says, I will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. Another scripture he gave us was Isaiah 62 from verse 1 to 4. says that uh, for Zion's sake you will not keep silent. He says that, um, uh, that you will no longer, I'm paraphrasing here, that you will no longer be known by your situation, but it will give you a new name. And another scripture he gave us was uh, Isaiah 43 verse 9. He says, Behold, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth in the wilderness. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to understand that every year and every season in our life, there has to be a theme. God always dealt, dealt with seasons. Amen? He dealt with seasons. That's why the scripture says, Blessed is the man in Psalm uh, 1. He says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the castle of the ungodly or sit in the, you know, you just quote it, praise the Lord. Uh, but he says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. He says, He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who will bear fruit in its season. Amen? So God deals with seasons. And in life, and that's why uh, we're looking into this. So let's just go a bit further. Genesis chapter 26. I'm going to start from verse 12 to uh, verse 25, and we uh, uh, take it from there. We're looking at the Isaac principles of fruitfulness. Glory be to God. Genesis chapter tw uh, 26, from uh, verse 12. It says, Now Isaac saw, if you're there, say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if you're not there, say, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Okay, Genesis chapter 26. If you want to go to Genesis, you want to go down this. Genesis. 26 from verse 12 says, Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer. He became very, and, and became very wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Take note of that. The Philistines envied him. Now all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Verse 18. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For, for the Philistines had stuck them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. 
But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herds of Gerar, the herds of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, "The water is ours." So he named the well Essek, because they have contended with him. Then, then they dug another well, and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sitna, and he moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth, for he said, At last the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac servant dug the well. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is funny, uh, as we look at this, uh, we find our son of Isaac, he's prosperous. Things are working out fine for him. The Bible says he was very fruitful. He had lots of, he was wealthy. How did they qualify his love? Because he had flock and he had, uh, he had so much flock of uh, sheep and he had possessions. He had, his household was great. Glory be to God. But there comes a, a little problem here. It's funny that the same Abimelech who allowed him to sow in that land is the same one who is telling him, get away from us. I want us to notice that. The same king, if you read from chapter 1, the Bible said, if you read from the chapter 1 of that same uh, uh, chapter, you find that uh, Isaac was, uh, was, there was a famine in the land, and was going, and the Lord ordered him to go somewhere. And he found himself in the rock. <coughs> and he had to lie and say that his, uh, um, his wife was his sister. And Abimelech then said to him, uh, then found out that uh, while, uh, you know, you know, the true uh, story came out later on. Because the Bible says, in the cool of the day, mm -hmm. Isaac, in the King James Version, was sporting with his wife. You know what that means, right? The man of God was sporting with his wife. He was caressing his sister. <laughs> Glory be to God. And a deep revelation came on the king. How can she be your sister? <laughs> and you're being very inappropriate. Glory be to God. And along the short of the story was that after he got caught in the act, glory be to God, the king made a proclamation saying, anyone who touches this woman will be put to death. And he gave him freedom to sow in the land. And as a result of sowing in that land, the question I want to ask you is that Isaac had the same land that other people had. That's the first question I want to, to ask you. Is that right? But God made a distinction between the livestock, the thing that came out, the produce of the life of Isaac, and the produce of the people who lived in Gerar. Bearing in mind there was a famine. Bearing in mind that the conditions were not nest, they were not uh, were not um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The conditions were not favourable. They were not conducive. Thank you very much. They were not conducive for him to be fruitful. But the Bible says, but Isaac sowed in that land, and in that same year he reaped a hundredfold. Now, if you go back in that same area in the Middle East, you can never reap a hundredfold. The most you can reap is about 80 fold. But the Bible says in that same year he sold and reaped a hundred fold. Let me tell you something. It's not about where you are. It's about who you are. Let me repeat that one more time. It's not about where you are. It's about who you are. You can be in the most barren place, the most arid place on earth because God called you fruitful. Amen? Amen? You see, when God uh, made Adam and Eve, and the Bible says he breathed into them, Amen? <laughs> he breathed that purpose in them. The purpose to be fruitful. He breathed it in them. It's inherent in them. 
So wherever they go, all they need to do is just obey the word of God. Amen? It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what conditions you're facing. You will be fruitful because it's inherent in you. But the problem now is the same guy who gave him the opportunity is the one taking the opportunity away from him. Because what will you do when your success becomes your trap? His success brought envy from all the Philistines. Never mind, you see, it, I would imagine that he also employed some of these Philistines. Listen, if we put it in today's, uh, in today's context, glory be to God, if we put it in today's context, like somebody having a company, and the company was very prosperous, would you think he would have employed people from that land? Would, do you think so? Do you think he will bring benefits to that same land? But the same people said his success is becoming too much. And the Bible says they were, they were scared of him. Amen? And it says just go away. Take all you have and go away. What would you do when all of a sudden your success becomes a snare to the people you, to the, to the land you're in? Amen? We're going to look at some principles here today. Some principles of fruitfulness. When the conditions are not favorable for you, what are you going to be doing? But the first thing you've got to understand, like David had the revelation, he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and my soul knows it well. Why does the scripture say my soul knows it well? Because there are going to be times when it's going to be questioned. There's going to be times where even you will be doubting your own abilities. And you need to get to the point where you know that you know that you know. And after you know, you know that you know. Glory be to God. You've got to get to that point where you know that's the number. You've got to know that you know that you know that you know. So the scripture that, that makes sense when it says, well, something you lay your hands on will prosper. It's not a cliche to you. And the problem with most of us as Christians is everything, we just quote these scriptures entirely, but we don't believe it. I shall be the head and not the tail. So, how comes uh, Isaac now finds himself, they're telling him the place that is prosperous. Amen? The place where he, he started from scratch is now prosperous. They're now telling him to leave that place. Uh, he must be thinking, oh my goodness, uh, how am I going to make it now? Where am I going to go now? Because bearing in mind, this is a place where there's famine. So, every other, every other place is dry. Amen? So even if he leaves where he is, he's going to another dry place. What if the favor he receives there, he's not, he's not going to receive it there? Amen? But one principle that Isaac had, that I believe he had, because he was told of his father, that he knew that it's not about where he is. Anywhere he goes, he will prosper. As long as he's obeying the word, the, the word of God. The Bible says, if you are willing and obedient, you do what? Eat the good of the land. That land is talking about is anywhere you are. If you are willing and you are obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Anywhere you go. It's not just saying your abode. Anywhere you go, that's why the scripture now makes more sense when he says to Joshua, where, wheresoever the soles of your feet shall tread upon, it shall be yours. So it's very, very important that we understand that principle. But going forward, knowing this, there will always be a time, and remember I said earlier, that though we deal with times and seasons, and God deals with times and seasons, I want to guarantee you this, in every step of the way of our life, there will always be a time of famine in our life. There will always be a time when things are moving up and then all of a sudden you hit a rock. And you're thinking, where do I go? Why do you think some companies fold up? Why do you think some companies fold up? Because there's just a, a change 